Okay, uh, what I'm going to talk about here is a, a little bit about, this is not quite in the text, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, fracture, failure. In the next chapter, oops, you can't see it on my in the next chapter, we're going to start talking about actually, uh, what? No, no, in the previous chapter, we talked about the, the, this notion of designing axial elements and uh, factors of safety and whatnot. And in those situations, we had a uh, failure strain for a particular material, and given the failure strain and the factor of safety, we get an allowable stress. So allowable was the failure stress over the factor of safety, right? So the factor of safety basically knocks it down, gives you a margin for uncertainty, uh, errors, overloads, unexpected things, and factor of safety, right? That's where it comes from. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the failure stress. So if you look at a stress strain, um, diagram for typical engineering type of material, you have an elastic region, and then usually you reach a yield, and then you start to get some amount of plasticity, and then at some point you get a fracture. Sometimes this curve even this is the stress where it actually fractures, right? But you can see actually there's another peak stress. This might, some people might call it the ultimate. And also we have the yield stress. So which one would you consider to be uh, failure? <clears throat> well, the notion of failure depends upon the design, actually. So I talked about this in class probably. So if you're designing door handle, uh, yield would be a failure value or a failure mode in the sense that as soon as your door handle starts to yield and keep bending more and more, you know, eventually it will not actuate the lock and unlock your door. So that for that design, it has failed. Now, if you're talking about designing eye pillar or a crumple zone in a car, in fact it's not, uh, it might be the fracture strike because you want that element, you don't care that it plastically forms. In fact, you want it to plastically form, but you don't want it to break, right? You're not going to reuse that car once you run it into a wall, right? So for that particular design, the fracture strike might be your criteria on the open, okay? So it depends upon the design, right? Um, sometimes even just a, a elastic elongation is enough for a mechanism to be that. So it could be a lower yield, right? Uh, so, but those are typically the, the things we see, okay? So that's the notion of failure. It depends upon, you know, we can talk about yield, ultimate fracture. Now, we also have of other types of phenomena. Well, actually, before we get to that, let's just talk a little bit about this. So, let's look at a, two materials. And actually, for those who have taken material science, appreciate this. Let's take one material. Okay. Maybe something like this. Okay. There's a lot of plasticity to it. Let's imagine that's a, a steel. And then you take the steel and you anneal it. Uh, so basically, get increased uh, stress where it yields. So here is material one, and this is material two. Two different steel, two steels, one's been, uh, uh, one's been worked, and one has been. Is this a cold work one, or is this a cold work one? Think of it. All right, 
Which one's better? Well, material two, the yield for material two is higher than the yield for material one. So if you're designing um, to that level, you might prefer material two. And someone might even say, well, even the fracture is higher for material two. The ultimate is higher for material two than for material one. So obviously material one is better. Well, that's not necessarily true. If you want to look at something like uh, uh, being able to absorb damage, you get quite a different situation. So a lot of times we talk about this notion of material toughness, or sometimes it's also called fracture toughness. Okay, this has to do with how the ability of materials to withstand plasticity, to withstand cracking a little bit of really fracture. So if you look at this, the energy that these materials can the first material can absorb that much energy before it fails. Right? This is this this is the total strain energy failure for material two. Now material one is quite a different situation. Right? Material one has this big plastic region. The amount of energy that material one can absorb until it fails is much greater than that for system two. So it depends upon what your design is. So if you want to design something that uh, wants to have a very high yield and it never has any chance to go yield, then you just get Cable to acts in nice static loading, material system 2 might be the way. If you're designing a hull of a ship, let's say, where the loading changes a lot, where it's cracking, it has to see a lot of weird situations, and you might see a like fracture, or maybe some damage due to a weapon or something like that, material 1 is okay? toughness of material, that's the amount of energy in the area of the curve until it fractures. Fracture. Uh, sometimes also, when you take a material and you cycle it, cyclic loading. So let's say This is done in such a manner that it vibrates up and down. So it continuously oscillates. Paper, right? Paper. So it's doing it like this. There's a, some mechanism that makes it vibrate. What you find here is basically as it starts to uh, cycle, even though it might stay in below yield, that the over time, uh, the stress at which it will fracture drops down. And that's what we call fatigue. Okay? So this has to do with cyclical loading. You have some situation like that if you design it to. If you don't want to use the uh, stresses that you get from the static stress strain curve to determine your failure stresses. You have to do uh, there's corrections for it you learn in design, uh, find your rules, so on and so forth, uh, the plots, to help you see how much the failure stress has to knock down due to the way it's cycled. And that has to do with the amplitude of the cycling, the number of cycles, and also steady state cycling. Also, sometimes in the opposite sense, we have uh, parts that maybe are bars with a static load on it, but it's held for very long times, or where there's elevated temperatures, okay? Very high temperatures. What you see there is this phenomenon of creep. Okay? 
So over time, even though P is fixed, over time, the ball will actually slowly stretch, strain the increase. In those situations, the, uh, again, as in fatigue, the, the stress that you find is failure, and then therefore also the allowable stress would drop because it's going to operate in a creep environment. Uh, there's other things that also knock down uh, sometimes things like moisture, temperature, even things like being in a, a highly caustic environment, a uh, high amount of radiation, these can all affect the strengths of the materials. And so when you're designing a component, you have to not only, you can't just blindly look at the stress strain curves and the failure stresses that are given in some tables, but you have to think about the environment. What are the failure stresses? This notion of fracture toughness, that's kind of the concept of the area of the current, it's the strain energy to fracture. And then fatigue phenomenon, 